students and welcome to class. All right, we are going to be now focusing on some of the different branches of Buddhism, the different denominations of Buddhism as we proceed throughout the rest of the semester. Well, let's take, let's go and get started here. And we're gonna be starting this week and next on the perhaps the oldest surviving branch of Buddhism, and that is Theravada Buddhism. Let's get started. The rise of Theravada Buddhism. This is the historical legacy of, of, of the Sangha. Remember that the community of monks and nuns We've described them as the heirs to the tradition of the Buddha. Well, like any religion, once the founder is gone, there are certain challenges that are going to emerge, including preserving the religion and staying unified. Whether we can, you know, we can think of the Catholic-Protestant divide, the Sunni-Shia divide, these different, the Sunni-Shia divide of Islam, and looking at these different how religions break up how they divide into different categories because they have different interpretations of the teachings of their founder different interpretations of how to practice and live the life of a religion in the context where the buddha is not present the sangha will those who are in charge of preserving the teachings of the Buddha, the community of monks and nuns, they'll face these same challenges of what do we do now that our founder, the enlightened one, the Buddha, is no longer in this world. Okay, so again, we've talked about the community of monks and nuns. We, you know, we have the, the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Sangha jewel preserves the teachings of the Dharma which were given by the Buddha. So the death of the Buddha will present challenges for preserving the Sangha. To respond to the challenges, we saw this earlier on in, the, in, in our early history lecture, the monks and nuns will attempt to preserve what they remember to be the teachings of the Buddha. And remember the Buddha never wrote anything down nor did any of the nor did any of his generation of followers. This is that there were all the teachings were preserved and passed down orally. And until really this first or second century common era is when we start to see writing coming out. And this is connected to imperial patronage. The Sangha will turn to different emperors to sponsor and support the monasteries, to support the development of Buddhist literature and texts. The Sangha will also be in charge of preserving the stupas. And the stupa, again, is the most common structure found throughout the Buddhist world. I believe this is a stupa from Myanmar that I have behind me. And in this context of competing for imperial patronage, trying to interpret and figure out what did the Buddha actually teach? What goes into these different baskets of teachings? Who's, you know, what monastic group is in charge of this stupa? What monastic group is in charge of that stupa? We're gonna see the different divisions. As Buddhism spreads, so too do these divisions within Buddhism. And we're seeing here a map of the spread of Buddhism. The spread of Buddhism is connected to three main branches. In the blue, we have the blue plus Japan over here is the Mahayana Buddhism. We have the Tantric Buddhism in the Himalayan regions and parts of East Asia. And in the red, we have the focus of this week and next, which is Theravada Buddhism. This is the Buddhism found predominantly in Southeast Asia and the country of Sri Lanka. 
Okay, so again, here's another map of the dissemination, Mahayana, Vajrayana, and Theravada. We're gonna do roughly two weeks on each of these branches, starting off with Theravada. So Theravada Buddhism, our major countries here, you can see Burma and Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Sri Lanka. So the big questions that we're gonna to ask today, and I would like you to have a sense of is, well, what is Theravada Buddhism and where do you find Theravada Buddhism? Theravada Buddhism, this is the dominant tradition in Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Burma, and Sri Lanka. So if one were to visit these five countries, this is the majority religion. The majority of Buddhists in these five countries, four of these five are in the region we call Southeast Asia. So Cambodia, Laos, Thailand and Burma. Burma is also goes by Myanmar. And then South Asia, we have the tiny little island of Sri Lanka, which is you know, right off of, right south of India. It's, this is sometimes referred to as the Southern branches. So if you hear Southern branches, often it refers to these countries and Theravada Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism is a minority Buddhism in these countries. So you do find Theravada Buddhists outside the, the countries we just mentioned, but they're minorities in Bangladesh, Vietnam, Nepal, Malaysia, and China. The Theravada refers to the school of the elder monks or the teachings of the elders. That's what we, what we mean by Theravada. Theravada prides itself on being really the oldest surviving tradition of Buddhism and claims that it, it preserves the, it does the best job of preserving the original teachings of the Buddha. Now all the traditions claim they preserve the teachings of the Buddha, but the Theravada tradition, well, they argue, well, we're the oldest, we're the elders, we're the ones who have best preserved it. In today's lecture, when we're thinking of Buddhism, not just Buddhism, but perhaps any religion, I'll say any religion, we have maybe the religious and spiritual aspect, and then we have more the cultural aspect. So we can think of Theravada as its religious ideals, attempts to overcome the problem of cyclic existence or samsara, to extinguish the three poisons and arrive at the state of nirvana. But then we also have the more cultural elements, Theravada in terms of art, culture, cuisine. Also as a cultural force, we can think of Theravada as it shaped different political institutions and different regimes throughout history. So again, Theravada Buddhism is our focus. Two aspects, Theravada as religion, Theravada, so Buddhism, specifically Theravada Buddhism as religion, and then what I'm calling Theravada as a cultural force. So for example, the stupa behind me, it has perhaps certain religious ideals, i.e. this is where you have the remains of a past Buddhist master, the relics of a great of, of the Buddhist past. And if you circumambulate, you walk around, you get good karma. That's the religious aspect. But then you have the artistic design, the architecture, you have the music and songs and festivals that take place around this area, the cultural aspect. Foundational to whether it's religion or culture, is the community, again, that I'm calling the heirs to the Buddha, the community of monks and nuns, the Sangha. Theravada scholars, and this is the scholars um, of Theravada, will often divide it into two aspects, the great tradition and the little tradition. What do we mean by that? The great tradition 
is really the focus of these religious t teachings that are supposedly not bound to any place that are found in the in the the, the sutras the vinaya the abhidharma the different collections of buddhist scriptures this will include also the practices of study and meditation the ideal of renunciation this means to give up here the monks or nuns are giving up attachment to money uh, attachment to sensual cravings to worldly relationships and the great tradition is the ideal of nirvana and remember the nirvana is the, <laughs> the blowing out of these different negative mental states and once that's been blown out it's hard to describe what exactly nirvana is it said that nobody can actually say what nirvana is you can only say what nirvana is not nirvana is not old age it is not samsara it is not suffering it's the state beyond those things the little tradition has to do with the royal council so throughout southeast asia and sri lanka have been different rulers throughout time and the sangha provides or certain members of the sangha provides advice on how that ruler can be a good the term is dharma raja the a dharma king a king that follows and supports the teachings of the buddha the little tradition will also provide rituals for laity during marriages during funerals during the birth of a new child during the harvest festivals tending to local gods and goddesses well one of the things that i find fascinating about buddhism is buddhism never really says your gods and goddesses that you've been worshiping they're false they don't exist you need to give them up to become a buddhist rather the gods and goddesses are adopted by members of the Sangha, and they are treated as being still stuck in samsara and of lower status to Buddhas and Arhats. Nevertheless, these gods and goddesses of the land can provide aid and benefits, especially once, once they formed this partnership with the Sangha, where the Sangha takes care of their shr the shrines, the Sangha makes offerings, We'll, we'll go more into that. And then serving as a field of merit, this will include the laymen and laywomen offering donations to get good karma. Okay. And just meeting the general needs of the public. And this could be that sometimes monks and nuns serve as teachers and educators. Often monks and nuns were, were the healers of society, providing medicine. And we'll learn today, especially monks and nuns were popular for making amulets and talismans to ward off evil. Okay, so Theravada Buddhism, let's start with the great tradition. The great tradition has its foundation in the different scriptural collections that we've called the Tripitaka, the three baskets of teachings. So this is the doctrine of the elders supposedly the original Buddhism, the oldest strand of Buddhism. The scriptures were originally in Sinhala, which is the language of, Sinha, of Sri Lanka, but then roughly around the first or second century common era, they get put down into a language called Pali. Pali is the international Buddhist language for all of the Theravada Buddhist nations in that the prayers are recited in Pali. Theravada religious identity is based on a sense of faithfulness to the Pali canon. The canon is a closed collection of texts. So the, the Theravada Buddhists align themselves with the scriptural traditions of Buddhism as they are written and preserved in the Pali language. So fifth to first century BC, perhaps second century BC, Pali becomes increasingly 
a common language throughout South Asia, and particular the, the chief medium of communicating thoughts and ideas about Buddhism. In the fifth century common era, so this is almost perhaps a thousand years after Siddhartha, a very important individual will enter the Buddhist world. And this will be one of the later day Buddhist masters called Buddha Gosa. Who is Buddha Gosa? So he's a great Theravada scholar. So Theravada Buddhism, this is one of the great philosophers and thinkers that Theravada Buddhist monks and nuns can claim. He himself was a monk, a member of the Sangha. He was born in India into a Brahm, to a Brahmin family. So this is a Brahmin is a priest associated with Hinduism. Buddha Gosa writes a very, very influential text that will come to be widely read throughout the Theravada Buddhist world. And that text is called the Vishuddhi Maga, the path of purification. In the path of purification, the end goal is to be a being that's reached nirvana. A being that's reached nirvana we call that an arhat. An arhat has perfected the Eightfold Path comprising of morality, meditation, and wisdom. This is a being that no longer is afflicted by the three poisons that keep cyclic existence spinning. And it's the path of the arhat which is the, the Vishuddhi Maga, the path of purification. That is the great tradition of, that's the path of the great tradition of Theravada Buddhism. All right, so the path of purification, these are monks and nuns striving to become an arhat through perfecting the Eightfold Path. And remember the Eightfold Path has three main components, morality, meditation, and wisdom. Let's take a little bit look at the Vasudhi the, 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 the Vasudhi Maga, the path of purification. So why follow the path of purification? And this is the, the scholar Buddha Gosa. Herein, purification should be understood as nibbana, also pronounced nirvana, which being devoid of all stains is utterly pure. The path of purification is the path to that purification. Let's pause here. What is that purification? Nirvana. The path of purification is a path to nirvana. It is the means of approach that is called the path. The meaning is, I shall expound the path of purification. So how do we approach this state of purification? How do we get to it? That is the path, and that is the path that Buddha Gosa in this famous text called the Vishuddhi Maga is going to elaborate on. And the path is morality, meditation, and wisdom. Purified morality or purified virtue, purified med meditation and purified wisdom leads to the purified state of nirvana. All right, and morality, this is the foundation of the Eightfold Path. And he asks, what is virtue? There is no virtue as volition, virtue as conscious contaminants, virtue as restraint. There is a, these, these are the different aspects of virtue. Virtue as non-transgression. Non so vol volition really is an intention to follow the moral rules and follow conduct. Conscious con concomitant is, this means not just following rules, but having a purified attitude while doing so, having a sincere, genuine attitude. Virtue as restraint, this refers to following the vinya, which is again the, the rules for the monks and nuns. Then virtue as non-transgression, 
This is disentangling the body and mind from negative actions and intentions based on the three poisons. So essentially, this is acting and behaving in a way where one is no longer motivated by the three poisons. But once virtue is perfected, his mind then seeks no other kind than the perfection of nirvana, the state where utter peace prevails. So once the virtue has been perfected, now the mind can start to seek the higher reality, and that's meditation. And Buddha Gosa will systematize the types of meditation that we looked at briefly earlier in the semester, and there's two major types. We have shamatha, this is calm abiding meditation, or single pointed focus on a single object. So concentrating on one's breath, concentrating on an image in one's head, say of the Buddha. These are all examples of calm abiding. Vipassana is insight meditation, where you're not just focusing on one thing, but rather you're allowing the mind to contemplate into deeper reality. And through understanding this deeper reality, one comes into three marks of existence, that all compounded things, all things that are of samsara are suffering, that all things are impermanent, and that ultimately there is not a self to be found among the five aggregates. While meditating, different states of consciousness, different states of a mind can awaken. This is according to the Theravada tradition as articulated by the scholar Buddha Gosa. And these are four qualities developed through meditation. Loving kindness for all beings. So one loves everyone. Compassion. This is a desire to free others from suffering. And this is not just everyday love or compassion. This is a deep, deep mental and conscious experience based on a purified mind. Sympathetic joy, this is rejoicing in love and care for others. And equanimity, this is a feeling of oneness with all beings. And there is no distinction between friend and enemy, family and acquaintance. Everyone is one in one's mind, and there is this equal amount of loving kindness, and compassion, and sympathetic joy. Meditation, and this will be very important when we get to the little traditions, also opens up certain magical powers. These include invisibility, flying, walking through walls, divine ears to hear human and spirit beings both near and far. So an arhat can maybe hear ghosts or, hung, or, or gods talking. Read the hearts and minds of others and recollection of past lives. All of these are powers that can be awoken through the, once one is purified moral conduct and is engaged in, earnestly in the discipline of meditation. And then divine eyes to see the karma of others. These are all powers associated with the Buddha as well. So that's morality, meditation, and then we finally get to wisdom. Wisdom has the characteristics of penetrating insight into the essential nature of phenomena. Its function is the abolishing of darkness of delusion, which conceals the essential nature of phenomena. How is wisdom developed? The purification of morality and wisdom are the roots of wisdom. Then one can develop the five purifications that are the trunk of wisdom. So wisdom, it's direct insights, direct understanding of what is true, what is the, the truth behind everything that we see. And arriving at wisdom entails five states of purification. So purification of the view, this is the teachings of the Buddha, the Dharma. Purifying any doubt that one has, Purification of knowledge and insights of what is and what is not the path. So what does lead to nirvana, what does not. Purification of knowledge and insight. This is the idea of not self independent origination. 
And then we have the purification of knowledge and insight. And this is the actual entering into the path of nirvana. All right, so that is our great tradition of, and kind of an introductory summary of Theravada Buddhism. So great tradition is study and meditation, renunciation, seeking nirvana. Now we're gonna go look at the little tradition. This is the stuff that in short, the Sangha does for the laity, those who are not monks and nuns. And this concludes the services done for the king as well. The little tradition and here, we can see the field of merit by offering to this, the monks and nuns, laymen and lay women receive good karma. All right, adopted by rulers, the Buddhist king, and this goes all the way back to Ashoka, we have this ideal of a king who rules and governs based on the Dharma. We call this the Dharma king or the Dharma Raja. The Sangha and the state will always be closely connected. And we'll see that more next week when we look at some of the different countries of Southeast Asia. And here's something to think of, you know, how might the Sangha benefit from having ties with kings and vice versa? Well, rulers can claim to have a certain sense of moral legitimacy by saying, oh, we are, we, we're, not, we're, we're not wicked rulers, we're governing based on the ideals of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And in exchange, the Sangha can get the money and resources from the rulers. Recall that when we talked about the history of Buddhism, how Ashoka in the Mauryan Empire really enable a vast prolifer proliferation of Buddhism by providing imperial money and support. So the Sangha, you know, community-centered relationships between the Sangha and laity. The Sangha is the field of merits. And there are special festivals that bring the laity and Sangha together. We'll see some of those in some of the documentaries we will be looking at. Food, language, and customs that one finds in these ceremonies is reflective of local culture. One other way that the Sangha and laity come into contact is through the practice of temporary ordination. This is mostly common in Theravada countries like Thailand and Laos, where a son can be can temporarily become a monk for a specific period of time. So in Thailand, for example, most men, I, I can't say all, but most at some point will become a monk, even if it's for a short period of time. This creates close ties between the Sangha and the laity. For also, um, having a child that is a monk that brings merit to the family, that's according to traditional belief. Traditionally, a mother or a, a lay woman could not touch a monk's robes except for if she, except for in the context, if it's her own son, then she can wash the robe, she can come in contact with the robes. This is a source of blessing. Ordination is both a religious and a cultural event. And we're going to take a little bit of a break to watch one of these ordinations right now. This is an ordination we're about to see from, from Thailand. This is a Buddhist monk ordination ceremony in Thailand. I'm going to keep the captions on. The ceremony starts with the parents of the monks greeting family and friends. This is very early in the morning. It's about uh, 7.30 a.m. <laughs> Members of the family cut the hair and it's put in a little boat to be used later. You'll see that at the end of the video. The monk here does the, the final 
shaving of the head. Here they ask their parents and all family, friends, and other monks for forgiveness. This is part of the goodbye ceremony. Those clothes haven't been worn ever before. They're brand new white clothes. This is the beginning of a parade to the main building on the temple grounds and they'll circle it three times. a tight-knit bunch. All of these people look familiar. They attended the wedding of myself and my wife uh, 14 years ago. throw money that's been wrapped up in paper. This is, symbolizes giving up money before they enter the, the monkhood. Both of them are 20 years old. And here the hair that they that was cut from them, which has been placed in a small boat, is floated down the river. All right, so we looked a little bit at a Thai ordination ceremony. The ordination is a ceremony where one is going to one will become a monk and we can see that the family is present that members of the community are present we saw both religious and cultural elements temporary ordination is very common so in some buddhist countries it's kind of a taboo to leave the monastery once one has become a monk or nun but in theravada countries particularly such as ter such as Thailand and Laos, it's quite common to have temporary ordination. The little tradition. This is one of the things I find very fascinating about Buddhism is we're getting into the world of the gods and goddesses of Asia as, as the Sangha, the members of, the, of, of the, the, the monks and nuns, the members of this, you know, the, the, the spiritual community, will encounter the different gods and goddesses of Asia via what we call the little tradition, the services for the laity, 
that's what we mean by the little tradition in short, the monks and nuns come to become both the masters and the caretakers of the gods and goddesses of the land. Okay, here is a spirit being, let's say named, her name is Hariti, a very common goddess. We'll learn a little bit about her shortly. Well, throughout human civilizations that have believed in spirits, that have believed in ancestors or gods and goddesses, people and humans who believe in these things want these beings to be happy. Well, why is it the case? Well, that's because happy spirit beings, they give human stuff. What do they give? Give rain and crops, health and food, long life. Money. These are all things that humans associate with happy spirit beings, particularly beings that have been made happy by human actions such as rituals and sacrifices and prayers. But then you got angry spirit beings. Throughout human history, humans have not wanted to have upset spirit beings, beings that are gods and goddesses, monsters that have been upset by humans. Why is that? Well, it's kind of the opposite of having happy beings. And the, these angry spirit beings that bring bad stuff, like, like, a, like a, a tornado, no food. Yeah, yeah, the harvest went bad because these spirit beings are angry. And no money, look at that. The piggy bank is open, but there's nothing in it. That's because the spirit beings were not happy. Coexistence with local gods and goddesses in Theravada society. In Theravada Buddhist societies, and in fact, throughout most of the Buddhist societies of Asia, it is the monks and the nuns, the Sangha, that will have will, will ultimately be responsible as to whether or not these beings are perceived of as being happy or angry and upset. There is a series of exchange relations that we're gonna look at. I call this the fourfold economy of care. So this is a term that I've, I've kind of put together and there are four components to this. The laity is, provides stuff for the Sangha, land, medicine, money, food. Maybe they donate their kids as they offer their kids to be, at least for some period of time, to be a monk or nun. So the laity provides for the Sangha. The Sangha will recite and offer materials to the shrines of local gods and goddesses. A portion of what has been given to the Sangha by the laity so a portion of what's been given to the Sangha by the laity, the Sangha will take a portion of that goods, whether it's crops or you know, prayer materials, and then go to the shrines of the different gods and goddesses and make offerings to them. The local gods and goddesses, these will pro these provide blessings to the Sangha. But the Sangha is like, you know what, we've given up all this stuff. We've given up attachment to money, We've given attachment to power. Uh, we know the body is in permanence. So all the stuff that these gods and goddesses are giving us, we don't want. So who are they going to give? Who, 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 who will the Sangha give the blessings to? This goes back in a circle. The Sangha transfers the power of the blessings to the laity. This is the fourfold economy of care. Let's take a look here. So the Sangha is the middle man or the middle woman between the gods and the laity. I got a few illustrations that'll help develop that some more. So the Sangha and laity, this is part one. Boom, we got the laity offering food, supplies, donations. With the support, the physical material support, the sustenance given to them by the laity, the Sangha will make offerings to the local gods and goddesses. Offerings might be reciting scriptures. Many Buddhists believe that the gods and goddesses, they really enjoy hearing the Pali recitations 
of the Buddhist teachings. Even if they can't, even if the gods and goddesses can't understand them or fully appreciate them, they're still soothing. And in exchange, the god or goddess provides a blessing. Also, incense or some other physical substance sometimes is offered. And again, the blessing goes back to the Sangha. The Sangha doesn't need it. So let's take a look here. Laity supports the Sangha, the monks and nuns. The monks and nuns make offerings to the gods. The gods give the blessings back to the monks and nuns. And the monks and nuns say, we don't need this. So we're going to give it back to the laity. And the laity, because they have good harvest, they have, they're healthy, they're happy, they're going to give back to the monks. The monks will continue the offerings to the gods and goddesses. The gods and goddesses give the blessings to the monks and nuns. The monks and nuns give it back to the laity. The laity does well. And so the cycle of this economy of care it keeps on, keeps on turning. And we have happy spirit beings. And it's all because of the Sangha. And this is again our, our cycle. Laity supports the Sangha. The Sangha cares for the gods and goddesses. The gods and goddesses give blessings to the Sangha. The Sangha who's renounced all these things says, we don't want it, so give it back to the laity. The laity then has the ability to care for the Sangha. The Sangha has the ability to care for the gods and goddesses and the blessings. And yeah, so it's, it's a very elaborate system of exchange. One image I want to talk to you about is, the, is a very popular deity named Hariti. This was originally a demoness with 500 babies. It was a mother with 500 babies. That's a lot of babies. And they cry. And what, what, why would a baby cry? Well, because they get hungry. So Hariti has to feed her babies. But her babies have an appetite for human babies. Her little demon babies want to eat human babies. Well, according to the story, one day people were telling the Buddha, Hariti is, is taking our children and feeding it to her kids. So the Buddha takes one of Hariti's children and Hariti in this state of grief goes around looking for the child. And finally she goes to the Buddha and the Buddha says, look, you've lost just one child and how much grief have you? Think about all the mothers who are grieving. And Hariti is like, well, but my kids, they want human flesh. And the Buddha says, well, through my power, they can now take non-human, non-meat offerings. They can be offered pomegranates. They can be offered, you know, dough or wheat. And Hariti says, deal. And not only that, Hariti, to repent for what she had been doing, says, I am going to be the protector of newborn human babies. The Sangha. So she becomes the protector of mother and children. Hariti is transported all over Asia by the Sangha. So as the Sangha goes all over Asia, China, Japan, to Tibet, Thailand, they carry these stories and traditions of Hariti, a goddess who can protect the, these newly born children. That becomes one of the one of the exports that Buddhism carries throughout all of Asia, this being. So the god is spread by the Sangha throughout Asia. All right, here are some things about you can think about and talk about during the discussion board. If Nirvana is the ultimate ideal, why have Buddhists not dispensed with gods and goddesses? You'll see that in the discussion boards this week uh, with the video. Um, of Cambodia, of Buddhism and religion in Cambodia. Another thing that we think about and talk about in the discussion boards is could Buddhism survive independent of the gods and goddesses revered by the laity? If the Buddhists said, ah, we're, we're, don't worry about these gods and goddesses, they're not important, would the laity still have supported the Sangha? All right, and let's take a look at some of these spirit beings. There's the Naga, these are serpent beings that are very, very intelligent, and they live in the water. They live in streams, ponds, lakes. They are said to sometimes be the protectors of scriptures. And we'll look at that a little bit later with uh, the Mahayana scriptures, which were believed to be protected by these Nagas. A Yaksha is a nature spirit associated with wealth and fertility. 
and they're the protectors of rare treasures. These are all the different types of beings that will be associated with Buddhism and will be cared for by the Sangha with the support given to the Sangha by the laity. Ah, oh, and then the ancestors. All right, one could ask, why are ancestors venerated throughout so many cultures? Something to kind of think about and kind of work through. Well, especially in Asian societies, Buddhism will take over caring for the ancestors via a system of merit transfer. The ideal is, can you create good karma for someone else? In the case of Buddhism, we have at least the sources indicate that the Sangha would take offerings and then the blessings received by the living laity could be transferred to the ancestors. So here we are, we have this exchange relationship. And then with this relationship, the merit goes from the laity that the laity is receiving, the Sangha can arrange for it to go to the ancestors. The ancestors who are perhaps in a lower realm, let's say a, a hell realm or hungry ghost realm, can then go on to a higher realm of rebirth. So the Buddhism will appropriate the ancestors. One thing, maybe this is a question I would like you to maybe consider in the discussion board. Do you consider Buddhism a religion? Why or why not? People ask me that all, all the time, is Buddhism a religion? Well, you're looking at you know, the history of the tradition, you're studying different aspects. In this discussion board, I'm, I, for this week, I ask you a little bit to think about the relationship between religion and culture and, and the video we're watching, which is specifically focused on Cambodia. All right, so diverse Sangha is diverse services for the laity, but there are two main groups of monks in Theravada society. We have town and city monks, and then we have forest monks. How might their lives be different? How might they provide different services for the laity? Well, town monks focus on study and teaching, whereas forest monks focus on meditation in Theravada societies. Forest monks, however, because of their meditative power, are believed to develop magical capacities, and they can use these powers to create magical objects for the laity. This is a very popular tradition in Thailand. These magical items are called amulets and talismans. So the forest monks have higher states of meditation and are believed also to wield magical powers. Apotropaic, this is a neat word, it means to ward off evil. And so these forest monks can create objects, talismans, amulets, charms, to ward off evil. They can do so because of the abilities that they've achieved through these higher states of meditation. Let's take a look. So the Thai amulet tradition, these are all amulets in Thailand that have been, the process is called consecration. This is to make an ordinary object holy. So the amulets in the Thai tradition, these will often have images of the Buddhas, past arhats, and other sacred symbols of Buddhism, maybe the Dharma wheel. Various materials, some are made of gold, some of wood. And again, these are objects that have been blessed, that have been made special. They've been zapped with a holy energy by a monk. So what does consecrate mean? It means to make it sacred or holy. And there's monetary worth to these objects also. You can go on eBay or Amazon and, and order these. There's a whole market for them. With that, this, let's take a little bit of a closer look. We're gonna watch a little short video of, of the uh, markets associated with
this is a short documentary on, well, we're gonna watch a little bit of it. This is the market associated with Thai amulets, Thai amulet traditions. Subtitles. <laughs> country that is closely related to Buddhist religions. The majority of the populations in Thailand are Buddhist and are engaged in activities such as going to temple. Although some of the activity seems non-relevant to Buddhism, people still do believe in these superstitions. An amulet is considered to be one of the superstitious belief since it has recently grown in popularity. Today, we will explore the topic of amulet in Thailand, what it is, what it meant for, compared to the perceptions that the society has today. Thai amulet's Okung Lang is an image of the sacred Buddha, which is worn on the person's neck. It is usually cast out of a mold or carved out of various materials. But the most common traditional ones are those manufactured from a mixture of many different ingredients, pressed in a mold and baked. Thai amulets can come in all different shapes, size, form, and thickness. They are largely manufactured by older Buddhist monks. is the most traditional type of amulet in Thailand. It is very sustainable in terms of long-lasting age, and it is the most commonly manufactured and traded in the industry. In order to make a powerful amulet, it must not only consist of wood and grease, but also made by those who are experienced and skilled at casting spells. Before the process begins, all of the people involved in the process must be cleansed to show their respect and recognition to the previous monks and spirits. The first step in making a clay amulet is to mix all the ingredients thoroughly. The exact mixture of the ingredients is usually kept in secret. Afterwards, it is pressed onto a previously designed print. And the last and the most important step in making amulets is to cast spells. A group of very skilled and respected monks gather and cast spells in temples, but many Buddhists can be involved in watching and praying. The process of making an amulet in Thai culture is traditionally considered very sacred and delicate. Amulets don't possess any real powers. Everything revolves around the law of karma. 
If we do evil deeds, no amulet can help us escape our fate. Amulets are for our peace of mind only. Also, collecting amulets, but not amulets of Thailand, amulets of Austria. The different churches, the different places, and a holy name. We have also much in, in, in Catholic, we have many uh, Catholic uh, holy, and they are all on, on this, with aluminium, they are from brass, from copper, and I collect this. And so I am interested in the amulet here also, but I don't, cannot read. Chalka is literally translated as borrowing an amulet, but it actually refers to as buying an amulet. It is a euphemism used to less offend the Buddhisms, since buying and selling with money is considered an immoral act for the religion. I started the amulet business because I liked it. I studied the business and how it functioned for a while. After I had enough knowledge of what I was going to do, I finally opened my own amulet shop, which is now 30 years of age. These amulets are from a person who we buy from temples and also some ordinary people. I can buy from them and sell it off for some purpose. They are a combination of real and fake you. Okay. So it's a little bit about the Thai amulets. And we're going to learn a little bit about how they're actually made. Just a little take a look here. So various magical properties is the last point. This can include the ability, sorry, here, let me just make sure that you guys are able to see that. This will include the ability, let's say for a mother who's having trouble conceiving a child, this will allow them to conceive a child. Good luck and fortune when starting a new business. These are all different attributes associated with the magical properties of amulets. The amulets have different values and different markets. So the power of the meditation master consecrating the object. So if this was touched or held by a really, really old ancient meditation master of the past, amulet is said to be worth more. The age, Charisma and routinization. Again, this has routinization is when you take the authority associated with the holy being of the past and try to preserve it through things like relics and so forth. The value of the physical materials. So sometimes certain amulets are made of gold or precious materials. Those will be worth more. Sometimes the kings would sponsor very, very um, large festivals for making these amulets. And then there's the merchant sale price, how much the merchant wants to sell it for. The consecration process. So how do these amulets become magical? And we saw in a little in the video some debate, is it just all superstition? Or is there something Buddhist about this? Well, here's the consecration process. It is actually monks, often monks in the forest who are meditation masters who will consecrate, who will make these physical objects holy. So we need accomplished meditation masters. And then through meditation, two qualities are produced. Magical powers called Siddhi. This is a special energy. This is something like the ability to fly, to control nature. That magical energy is Siddhi. And then loving kindness. This is the compassion side the master. The sacred object is brought in their presence. So an image of the Buddha, a locket, a necklace is brought to the meditation master. The med this, the object is purified and then the loving motivation is transferred from the master into the object as the master holds a little bit of a string a string that acts as a kind of a, a ties in the two together, the object and the master. The master will do some recitation of prayers, perhaps reciting some scriptures in the Pali language. And then a transfer takes place of the mental or magical power 
a residue of that, a, a imprint of that goes from the master who's holding the string into the amulet. All right, so that is our introduction to the great and little traditions of our first major tradition, first major, let's say for lack of a better word, first major sect within Buddhism, the Theravada Buddhism, predominantly found in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. All right, that concludes our lecture for today. As always, stay healthy, stay safe, stay well, and stay tuned.